pop culture would have us believe that parents can't wait to have their kids leave home. But the truth is that about two-thirds of us have a hard time when our home that was buzzing with life for the last 20 years suddenly becomes way too quiet. I've been blessed with a 33-year marriage and two amazing boys who took me on the journey of a lifetime. It was a crazy, fun, heartbreaking, and joyous roller coaster that never stopped moving. And it all happened in the blink of an eye. My kids are still a major part of my life. They're in college now. They place a high priority on family and we all make time to be together. But their lives are becoming increasingly independent, as they should be. The crazy energy of kids around the house that kept me outwardly focused is subsiding and I find myself back in a familiar but uncomfortable place where I'm confronted with myself. I think we're all better off when we're more focused on service than ourselves. My mother's always been there for me and she's still a major influence in my life. I had three male role models growing up, my brother, my father, and my grandfather. My brother left for college as I was entering high school and my dad died of heart failure two years later. And then a few months after that on my 16th birthday, my mom and I sat with my grandfather as he suffocated from pneumonia. My mom and I lost our home and we were left with a mountain of bills, but we got through it together. We worked hard, made good decisions, and by the grace of God, we came back stronger than before. While the past shapes who we are, it doesn't define us. Our relationship with God defines us. Adversity makes us stronger, but adversity isn't an end. Over and over we find that we're made stronger than we ever thought possible. So many of us journey through life seeking that elusive thing that will finally make us complete, looking to money or sex or power as an escape or to serve as an absolution when all the while the love that's all around us is pleading with us for a place in our lives. We just have to open the door. The summer after I graduated from high school, my older brother and I came home to work. We scraped together a couple hundred bucks and rode the 550 miles from our hometown in northern Illinois to the northern tip of Minnesota. No restaurants, no hotels or support wagons. It was the best week of my life up to that point. I remember gliding anonymously through the rolling landscapes of Wisconsin and being amazed and a little confused by the settled beauty. I'd spent time trespassing in places where people were supposed to hike and camp, but to me, there was a quiet richness to this place, and it seemed eager to sustain life. But life was still waiting for me when I returned home. Thanks to a family friend, I was fortunate to get a good paying job in a local mine. It was dangerous and difficult work that left me with nightmares of cave-ins and being buried alive for years but it paid the bills. When I wasn't working there, I was taking whatever work I could get my hands on while attending St. Olaf College. I'd been admitted on a number of prestigious scholarships that should have gone to someone who deserved them. For reasons I'll get into later, I didn't stand a chance academically and I hated the place. The upshot was that I transferred to Valparaiso in Northwest Indiana, where I worked as a street sweeper to make ends meet. I had a serious drinking problem by that time, and my grades were horrible. And then suddenly, things took a turn for the better. I was at a party when I first met her. I was too physically exhausted and full of beer to notice the two beautiful girls that walked by outside, but my friends noticed and cheerfully lifted them over their shoulders caveman style and carried them in. Six months later, I was engaged to one of those girls, and 33 years later, we're still married. The other girl is still an old friend and one of the finest women I know, and those old buddies still keep in touch. My wife and I got married while we were still in college. She waited tables and the blisters on my hands hardened. We studied at night and eventually got our degrees. Then we traded off working while the other one went to graduate school at the University of Illinois in Champaign. It took us over 10 years, but eventually, I got out of the business school with a master's and good grades, and now I like to say that I married a doctor for her money. 
And then, just like that, Nathan arrived with an extraordinary mind and a full head of red hair, and everything changed. I knew right away that I had found my place as a father. Before we knew it, we were blessed with a second son, Ben, and seven nephews. Both of our boys are better people than I'll ever be, and that was my goal. They're the joy of my life. Nathan means gift of God, and Benjamin means son of my right hand. We hiked and rode all over America. Sometimes we walked in places where few people can go. And sometimes we walked at night when the world was sleeping and the air was so still that dust particles hung in the moonlight. We talked, argued, and laughed. But more than anything, we grew together in our Christian faith. It was tough when my kids left for college. As parents, what is our calling when our kids leave the house? That's the fundamental question I'm pursuing here. So here's the plan. I'm going to return to my roots and look for answers while section riding from the southern border of Wisconsin to Duluth, Minnesota. I'm going to document the ride and offer a little information about the communities I pass through. But what I'm searching for is a heading on my path. I'm searching for my calling. So before we roll, I should briefly introduce myself. My name is Pete Gorski, but my trail name is Pi, like the number. On America's long backpacking trails, hikers give each other trail names that in some way describe who they are. Pi is the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter. Now, I know for some people that just brings back painful memories of math class. And most people take math for granted without ever wondering why it's even there in the first place. But when I look at a circle, I see design. It's complex, perfectly logical, and beautiful. When I was young, my body would do pretty much whatever I told it to for as long as I wanted it to. Not so anymore. As I got older, I felt inferior to the heroes who would talk about hiking your own hike or riding your own ride, while invariably reminding you of just how far and how fast they went. I'm over that. I like to ride bikes and backpack, but I'm also 55 years old. My body's totally banged up and I ride a desk for a living. And I like ice cream and pizza. And I like to take my time when I ride and hike. I remember watching the Ironman Championships on TV years ago and the announcer saying something about reaching beyond your limits so you could touch your soul. And I thought, what a load of crap. I get that self-imposed suffering can make us physically and mentally stronger, fine. But suffering isn't the point, and it definitely doesn't make your soul visible. When my brother and I did this ride back in 1985, we were almost broke. I literally borrowed my camping equipment from my dentist, who most definitely was not broke. Part of the reason we slept outside was because we had to. But even if we'd had the money, I'm not sure we would have stayed in hotels because so much of what we did was about reverse snobbery, and that meant doing it the hard way. I'm going to do this ride in sections, and I won't be sleeping on the ground. My older son and I did the first little section from the border of Monroe on our way back from a section north of Madison that I'll talk about a little later. You'll notice in this snappy overhead footage that I'm wearing pants and not riding shorts, and that's because we'd spent much of that day walking around Madison getting killer video footage for your later viewing pleasure. It's here that the Jane Addams Trail in Illinois turns into the Badger State Trail in Wisconsin. Most of the state is checkered with bike and ATV trails. Just a heads up, if you're on one of these trails in autumn, wear blaze orange and expect to hear hunting rifles. And once you get as far north as Madison, 
Check yourself for ticks if you get into tall grass. And no matter where you are outside of the urban areas, be prepared for farm dogs. During the ride to Monroe, we naturally reflected on why people like me feel compelled to walk or ride a long way from here to there. There's no simple answer to that question. I think the most common explanation I hear is that people just like to get outside and enjoy nature, and I can relate to that. But there's something much deeper going on because outdoor journeys come with a lot of challenges. The goal of hiking the entire Appalachian Trail in a single year, for example, in purely practical terms, could be compared to hiking the same distance from Chicago to Eugene, Oregon, except throw in some snow, and hail, ticks, mud, dizzying heat, injuries, maybe a month or so of rain, and a stunning lack of hygiene. But there's something magical about the trail. It's just really difficult to put a finger on what that magic is. A lot of people say it's about the simplicity. It's true that bike packing and through hiking definitely force you to pare down to the essentials, but at the risk of sounding like a know-it-all, life on a bike or trail might create the illusion of simplicity, but in reality, it's not nearly that simple. There's a ton of technology and outside support involved. I think there's a single common thread that's almost always overlooked, and that's the search for meaning. Adversity in nearly all forms is a stark reminder that we're actively pursuing something important, something meaningful, and there's a unique thrill associated with that pursuit. Long distance riders and hikers almost universally thrive on that form of adversity. Meaning is an elusive thing. It's difficult to even define without invoking the thing itself, like saying something has meaning because it's important, which doesn't really mean much. The idea of meaning can't really be broken down into smaller pieces. It's what we might call a first principle. It just is what it is. So here's the thing, and this is important. We recognize meaning when we experience it, and it's thrilling when that happens. So even though we can't define it, we can at least describe what it feels like. I know from first-hand experience that the sensation of meaning occurs when I'm aligned with God's will. Now, I know this is where nihilists and agnostics and atheists will roll their eyes, that's fine. We're all entitled to our opinions. The nihilist and the atheist will say that life has no meaning and we're here by accident, and that the sensation of meaning is just a function of survival instinct. The agnostic might just shrug. But like it or not, the universe boils down to highly organized information, which is derived from a mind. Reality itself is self-apparently intentional. And at the end of the day, I know Jesus personally and he knows me. A long distance hiker ride that ends with a triumphant picture and then a car ride home is notoriously depressing. But one that ends with a greater sense of meaning or purpose can be hugely uplifting. And meaning is something we experience when we're aligned with God's will. As you enter Monroe from the south, there's no missing what was for many years the massive Joseph Huber Brewing Company. That facility is now an ethanol plant on the south end of town, and it still smells good like fermenting beer. Monroe is known as the Swiss cheese capital of the USA and is county seat of Greene County. Downtown has a collection of quaint shops and restaurants that have a noticeably Swiss theme. It has plenty of parks, a nice hockey rink, and a long business strip. The population's a little over 10,000. The schools are pretty good, and crime is low. Monroe has a family-friendly feel. You can cover the 50 miles from Monroe to Madison by bike, mostly along the Badger State Trail, and it's a great ride. If you're not interested in doing that many miles all in one day, then stop at Kempler's Supermarket in Monticello for local baked goods and jerky, and then stay overnight at the Swiss-themed Chalet Land House a little further north in New Glarus. The breakfast that's included on weekends is outstanding Wisconsin fare. 
I'll tell you a little story about Nuclearis that says a lot about this part of the country. The first overnight hike that my older son and I did was when he was 11. We hiked the 16 miles from Albany to Nuclearis along the Sugar River Trail. We left around 4 p.m. in a driving blizzard that got more intense as we went. And we pulled in nearly six hours later, cold and hungry. Trails take on a different personality at night. To him, we were walking through an enchanted forest. We were never in any real danger. It's not the kind of trail you could lose in the snow. And you're never more than a half mile from a farmhouse. But I was happy to watch him live the adventure. And we cherish that memory to this day. Late in the hike, racing against the rising snow, we crested a long climb and we found ourselves looking down on the warm twinkling lights of Nuclearis in the valley below. When we pulled into the chalet with steam rising from our faces and hands, the woman working the front desk told us that she'd seen us walking and was going to offer us a ride. But then she saw our backpacks and hiking boots and she figured we wanted to walk. She was right. A few minutes after we checked in, there was a knock at the door. She had heated up some chocolate chip cookies for us, because that's what a mother would do. Of course, there are people and places in Wisconsin that aren't so hospitable, but I could go on for an hour with similar stories of kindness that I've experienced in this state. We all know that hospitality is good, but why is it good? And how do we all know that it's good? And perhaps more to the point, why do we care about what's good? It's not an obvious question, but yet everybody seems to inherently know it's there. Here's my point. God is the foundation. We can choose to accept his will or not, but that choice is ultimately bound by God's sovereignty. In other words, we choose our path, but the outcome is already set. Calling is the process of the Holy Spirit handing us the gift of true meaning, which is God's will, and us awkwardly groping around for his hand until we find it. Imagine a father who's a skilled carpenter handing his hammer to his child and then patiently helping the child learn how to drive a nail. The child will make mistakes and might even get hurt, but eventually, with the father's guidance, the son achieves the goal. The son says, look what I did. And the father says, I'm proud of you. And the son feels the deep satisfaction that comes from making his father proud. It's entirely a gift from the father at his own expense. It's amazing just how much of being a Christian is simply about accepting gifts. Accepting these gifts is as simple as sincerely saying that you accept God's son, Jesus, as your Lord and Savior. If you do, just know that it was the Holy Spirit who brought you there. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are three separate persons, but they're all the same God. It will make more sense once you get to know them. Verona is a beautiful town just 10 miles south of Madison. This is, in my opinion, home to the best cycling in the entire country. Good roads with light traffic, rolling hills, great views, and a small town every few miles. Verona has a nice little business district, and AJ's delivers good pizza. The first time I walked through Verona a few years ago, I was with my son, and I was growing dreadlocks, like the dirty hippie kind. Hang on, I'll let that sink in for a moment. So yeah, I was the scary looking guy who wandered in from the trail. I was muddy, large, and because it was deer season, I had a blaze orange cover on my backpack. I plodded into a pleasant independent grocery store downtown to resupply and was met at the door by, I kid you not, a guy in lederhosen playing an accordion. Just past him were some girls doing a fundraiser with chatting moms keeping a close eye on things, so I got some cash back at the register to just give them. But as I approached them, 
The girls quickly took shelter behind their moms and peered out at me warily. Totally understandable and sort of funny, but also kind of a bummer. As I reached out to hand a day's wages to one of the confused girls, the look on mom's face was priceless. Her calculations were adding up to a quiet act of kindness, but she was still ready to go full mama bear on me if I made any sudden moves. So I slowly backed away from Mama Bear and her cubs and slipped out into the cool night with my Robert Plant lookalike son. Worth every penny. A few months later, I was walking in the park next to my house, which is in a town with almost no crime. Mom was walking toward me, pushing a stroller with one hand and holding a second child with her other hand. When she noticed me, she got nervous and put herself between me and her kids. I cut off my dreads that night. Now I'm old enough to remember the 60s. Yeah, hippies were all about peace and love until the drugs and money ran out, and then maybe not so much. I'm not talking about the groovy kids on the Brady Bunch or the parodies we now see at Halloween parties, but actual hippies who were occasionally untethered. So why would a guy like me grow dreads in the first place? Well, that's kind of the point. I find myself among a dying breed of people still hanging on to the crazy notion of treating people as individuals and sharing ideas. When I had dreads every now and then, people who would otherwise have nothing to do with me would chat me up. And if people treated me worse because of my dreads, which happened kind of a lot, then I was grateful to them for keeping me grounded. Here's my point. I know that for some people, nonconformism might not be something they care about or even like. My wife falls into that camp, and that's fine to each their own. But for me, I want to have some room for personal expression in whatever I do. The logical way to proceed from Verona is to head due north to Middleton before heading up the Highway 12 path to Sauk City. But you'd be missing out on Madison just a few miles out of your way east, and it's an amazing place. There's more to Madison than brats and beer, although it certainly excels at both. Just understand before heading out on foot or by bike that some parts of Madison are safer than others. On the day that I most recently explored Madison on foot, I had both of my boys with me. Coming from Verona, we headed northeast through pleasant neighborhoods until picking up Monroe Street. We passed the beautiful campus of Edgewood College, which is a highly regarded Catholic liberal arts school in the Dominican tradition. Just before reaching the southern edge of the University of Wisconsin, we'll pass through what I think are the coolest three blocks in the entire city with an eclectic collection of unique and interesting shops. There's no mistaking at this point that you're in a Big Ten University town, but what sets the UW campus apart is the beautiful lake that serves as the north border. If you explore the university buildings, then you'll be rewarded with cool surprises and beautiful architecture. We stumbled on a trombone ensemble in the music building and an incredible art museum. After climbing the hill to Bascom Hall for an awesome view of the Capitol, we went inside and were struck by the stateliness of the building that was built in 1851. I loved the smell of century-old hardwood and marble. You can play pool at the Memorial Union, and if weather allows, you can eat a simple lunch on the huge deck overlooking the lake, or stay inside for some beer and brats. Although on my last visit, I went for the grilled cheese and onion rings. For other food options, downtown is just a few blocks away and has a lot of interesting choices. You can take a nice long walk from the campus out to Picnic Point, and if you're a golfer like I am, then definitely check out the scenic and challenging University Ridge Golf Course in Fitchburg where the UW golf team plays. Madison has a lot of what they refer to as bike lanes, 
which are demarcated by a white line that wouldn't stop an ant. So maybe you have a little bit of room to ride your bike, but you're putting a lot of trust in the drivers that are flying by your left side. A few weeks ago, I started getting multiple videos in my YouTube feed about the INFJ personality type. After watching the first video, I knew for sure that YouTube algorithms had pegged me correctly. They can appear quite intense to most people who don't know them. However, if they share their thoughts and feelings, you quickly learn that they are very emotional and much more sensitive than they appear. They tend to have a strict moral code and generally act in accordance with their values and beliefs. Unfortunately, this can cause them problems in a society that has a very rigid definition of what a man is supposed to be. And then there's a the matter of trust, which they take very seriously. It is at the heart of their value system. It is very rare to be an INFJ male and so it can be hard to grow up and function in a world made to misunderstand them. It can take them a long time to mature and realize their differences are actually strengths, such as their deep empathy and kind nature. They don't follow anyone. They make their own path in life and it can be quite inspiring if you're part of the few. I decided to take the Myers-Briggs personality test just to be sure, and it validated. I belong to the rarest personality type, which includes just a fraction of a percent of all men, and which validated that I've always been able to get along with most people while never really fitting in anywhere. I'm not about to build my life around a personality test, but it gave me some clarity regarding my strengths and weaknesses and how I can better serve Christ going forward. From the UW campus, you can head back west through beautiful Shorewood Hills to the quiet, tree-lined streets of Middleton. Middleton is consistently rated as one of the best towns in the entire country. It's safe, has a beautiful downtown, and it is actually very bike-friendly. There are dedicated bike trails on the west end of town, and from there you jump on the 10-mile-long U.S. Highway 12 path to head north. It's noisy along 12, but where it ends, you can just jump onto country roads. The hills from here to Rochester, Minnesota should not be underestimated. Here's what Wikipedia has to say about it. The Driftless Area, a region in the American Midwest, comprises southwestern Wisconsin, southeastern Minnesota, northeastern Iowa, and the extreme northwestern corner of Illinois. Its landscape is characterized by steep hills, forested ridges, and deeply carved river valleys with spring-fed waterfalls and cold water trout streams. The steep river landscape is the result of glacial rivers that flowed into the Great Lakes southward, thereby forming the Mississippi River Valley. As you head west, you'll pass through beautiful and history-rich Sauk City. There's a nice little farm stand on the east end of town, and the bridge over the Wisconsin River has a wide raised section for bikes and pedestrians. As soon as you cross the bridge, you'll see the awesome little business district on your right. There's a good Mexican restaurant and lots of interesting little shops that are definitely worth checking out. The town has lodging and is quite safe. Sauk City was incorporated in 1852, making it the oldest in the state. It's also the site of the first Culver's restaurant, home of the Butter Burger. Mmm. And if that's not enough, Jacob Leinenkugel of beer fame was born and raised here. There's a long story based in nearby Darlington about a feud between the Ringling Brothers and a guy named Butch Parson who ran a concession wagon. Parson was making a fortune selling pink lemonade, stogies, and cracker jacks at the circus, and the Ringlings wanted in on the action. They got rid of Parson in an ugly split, but not before he made out with a ton of money. Having too much money and power is dangerous. We need others around us to let us know when we're going off the rails. The more time and money you have on your hands, the less people are around to correct you. The Bible instructs us to humble ourselves first to God and then to one another. 
always striving to outdo one another and being honorable. God often uses people around us to keep us on the right path. I like the idea of increased independence as I get older, but at the same time, I want to keep people around me who will put a boot in my rear when I need it. Purpose and independence are nice, but they have to be tempered with real accountability or you can wind up veering off into the weeds. Nathan joined me for the ride from Sauk City to Reedsburg. It was an absolute joy having a fun weekend together with him. Our intention was to take advantage of a stiff north wind and ride the route in reverse from Reedsburg to Baraboo to Sauk City and then push further south to Madison where we would capture some footage of the city. But as I'll explain in a moment, it didn't work out that way. We got a late start hitting the road around 4 p.m. and that left us four hours till sundown to cover the 55 miles to Madison. The roads from Reedsburg to Baraboo were no problem. From there, Route 12 cuts a more or less straight line due south to Sauk City, and on Google Maps, it looks like a smooth, wide shoulder. So we thought we'd give it a try. But when we got to the entrance ramp, there was a sign prohibiting bicycles. So we rerouted on locals and were immediately confronted with the particularly steep and unrelenting hills that helped make the area around Baraboo and Wisconsin Dells a popular tourist destination. When we later once again crossed Route 12, there was no signage prohibiting bike traffic, so we jumped on. But within just a few minutes, we knew that wasn't going to work either. The shoulder had deep vertical grooves that made our bikes dangerously squirrely, and the traffic was unbearable. We stopped in Bluffview at the bottom of a massive, miles-long hill to regroup, and looking across the road, we saw what looked like a large abandoned industrial area that was overgrown and fenced off. But on further inspection, we realized that we were looking at an old army munitions plant that had been repurposed as a wildlife and recreation area. The gate was open, and even better, we could pick up the Great Sock Trail from the far side of the wreck area. What a find. It was one of the most bizarre landscapes I've ever seen. About 10 miles down the path, we entered Prairie du Sac, which is an awesome mid-sized town that neighbors Sauk City. The Wisconsin River is dammed here and forms a wide, slow-moving section with beautiful beaches. The town also has a pleasant downtown strip. But by the time we got there, we knew we were going to be rolling into Madison after dark. I had already ridden the section from Madison to Sauk City twice in the previous month, so we decided to cover new ground and ride back to the car via Devil's Lake State Park, and we were glad we did. The park is maybe five miles across and is like a little slice of Olympic in Washington State with steep boulder-covered hills and leafy trails. If someone blindfolded you and dropped you next to the lake, you could easily think that you were sitting at 7,000 feet somewhere in the Cascades. I'm going to once again emphasize that the hills in this region should not be underestimated. But that said, the payoff at Devil's Lake was worth the effort. A realization has started to come into focus for me. The fatherhood doesn't end when the kids grow up. Instead of me mostly imparting guidance and wisdom, I find that my boys and I are rapidly growing together in a way that could only be possible where the Holy Spirit is at work. I rode the section between Reedsburg and La Crosse from north to south in order to take advantage of a strong northwest tailwind. I started on the Bud Hedrickson Trail just on the east end of La Crosse, where on one side was a quiet neighborhood with cozy mid-century homes, and on the other side there was light industry. And right down the middle there was a trail and a rail yard. I really liked the hard-working Rivertown aesthetic of La Crosse. The trail wound through the east edge of town before meeting I-90, which had paralleled for the next 20 miles before meeting the Elroy Sparta Trail. I stopped for a short time in West Salem, which had a nice little downtown and a park with public facilities. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw the Three Brothers Bad Company on the edge of town. Heading west, I passed by the U.S. Silica Company just west of Sparta, 
and I was impressed by the scale of the plan. In all, I found the La Crosse River Trail to be pleasant with a few interesting sights, though there was at times a lack of variation. I quickly resupplied in Sparta and ate a snack by the river before heading southwest out of town. From the moment that I crossed I-90, I felt a change. The terrain became hillier and more heavily vegetated with ferns, almost like the Pacific Northwest but with small limestone bluffs. The highlight of this trail, without a doubt, was Train Tunnel 3, just north of Norwalk. The tunnel was built in 1873 and is nearly a mile in length. A hundred yards in, it becomes too dark to see without a bike light, and the temperature starts to feel like a cave. The sounds of the tunnel were oddly eerie. I stopped for the night at the Mid-Trail Motel in Wilton. It was a no-frills motel with just four rooms and thin walls, but it was clean and warm, and the beds were comfortable enough. The next day, I rode back to Reedsburg on the 400 State Trail. I found it to be a lightly used but exceedingly beautiful trail that passes through quaint towns every 10 miles or so. It was just outside of Wilton that I met Frankie. I'm changing his name to protect his privacy. Frankie was a friendly and outgoing guy with an unspecified developmental disability who was on a multi-day trip along the same trail system I was on. He was lacking adequate repair tools and was having trouble with noisy brakes. He was also uncertain about where he was going to stay that night. He was carrying a tent and I assured him that there were a couple campsites not far ahead, but it was cold and wet. We parted ways at the next tunnel, which was very long and which he intended to walk, but it left me with a lingering sense that I should have done more to help him. I pray almost daily for the strength to represent Jesus, but I fail all the time, and I think I failed that day. I wish I was a better person. I wish I trusted people more. I wish I could stop thinking of time as mine or as something that I never have enough of because neither is true. Someday I'll have unlimited time, and I hope Frankie is there to let me know that he got there just fine. I love La Crosse. It's a hard-working and historic town built right under the deep limestone bluffs of the Mississippi River. It has a vibrant, eclectic downtown that's built into regentrified turn of the century factories. There's an excellent community theater right on the banks of the river. It was there that Nathan and I once saw the secret garden put on by a group of unbelievably talented people from all walks of life in the area. There's a wide variety of awesome restaurants and bars and plenty of nice hotels within walking distance. For breakfast, be sure to visit Rosie's Diner for some good home cooking right in the middle of a comfortable and interesting neighborhood. You can go for a drive down the Mississippi or head a little further east on the Root River Trail to visit some of the many scenic small towns. From La Crosse, we once took a day trip to Decorah, Iowa to watch the Luther College football team play none other than St. Olaf. If you ever get to Decorah, be sure to stop at the Norwegian American Museum and then get a platter of Old Armory barbecue you won't be disappointed. The section from La Crosse to Rochester was my favorite of the entire trip, especially the area around the Root River. The beauty here isn't obvious. It's like a beautiful older woman with long gray hair and warm weathered eyes that are full of mercy and understanding. There were times when the landscape looked like central Idaho one minute, and then I'd switch back up a huge climb and find myself right back in the Midwest before plunging right back down into Idaho. There always seemed to be a surprise at the bottom of each hill, a river, a campsite, or maybe a reproduction 1950s gas station then back up another mile-long climb to the rolling hills of southern Minnesota. 
Every time I return from a place as beautiful, I wonder why I live near a big city. The answer is family and work, but it's not hard for me to imagine us living outside of Rochester or Madison eventually. Just not yet. One thing is for sure, I have no interest in going back to working in an office every day. I rode in a slow moving shiny metal box for two hours a day, five days a week, for 25 years, so that I could sit all day in a little cloth box. If I was lucky, I saw the sun a little during my commute, or maybe if I managed to get out for a walk after lunch. COVID put an end to that. Now the Lord has blessed me with the opportunity to work from home, and I don't want to ever go back. Nathan was with me again this weekend, and it was a hot, sunny day. So we were pleasantly surprised by an unplanned 20-mile stretch along the paved and nicely shaded Douglas State Trail, which ended in Pine Island. From there, it was another 15 miles on hilly dirt roads to State Road 52, where we stopped to cool off and reassess our route. It was one of those days when your glasses fog if you go too slow, and even the dust feels hot as it sticks to your skin. So another 25 miles of roller coaster dirt roads didn't sound especially appealing. We chose to run right up Minnesota State 52 to make a beeline for Cannon Falls, knowing full well that a similar decision north of Madison had not worked out. But with a strong tailwind and what turned out to be a huge shoulder that was pool table smooth, we sailed the remaining miles in no time, joyfully hammering up long hills and high gears. We had to do some improvised bushwhacking around a couple construction zones, which was probably the high point of the ride. Cannon Falls is a quaint town nestled along the Cannon River, about halfway between Rochester and Minneapolis. We ate our weight in steak and fresh vegetables at the Rancho Loco Grill in town, just off the highway, and it was outstanding. This area brings back a lot of memories for me. I mentioned earlier that I spent some time at St. Olaf, which is a snooty little liberal arts college not far from here in Northfield, Minnesota. I had no business being there. My background made me an appealing charity case, but I was a hard drinking, impulsive kid with working class ethics, dyslexia, and PTSD. There was zero chance of me getting out of there intact. There was a gang of entitled and yet freakishly insecure brats in my freshman dorm who wouldn't hesitate to mercilessly torment anyone in the pursuit of validation, including, and perhaps especially, the most vulnerable among us with significant disabilities. I was generally capable of defending others and myself, but I had my limits and I wasn't prepared at that time for what these guys were eager to dish out. Some of life's difficult and profound lessons come from real evil we encounter, and what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. It took me another 30 years to realize that the only battles of any kind that I've ever really won were the ones that I took the highest possible road through prayer and the strength of Christ. As you explore the wonderful Twin Cities, understand that as with any major metro area, some parts are safer than others. That said, you could easily spend the better part of the week here before having some sense of what it has to offer. If you're an art person, then check out the world-class Minnesota Museum of Art, St. Paul, which has street parking and free admission. Or for a more kid-friendly alternative, Check out the Como Park Conservatory and Zoo. The conservatory is particularly impressive and is a nice little winter respite. After working up an appetite, head to the Midtown Market in South Central Minneapolis where you'll find an array of eclectic indoor shops and restaurants to choose from. If you 
you want to see the University of Minnesota, then definitely grab some falafel and fries at Wally's in Dinky Town, just north of campus. Or head to St. Paul to grab an overstuffed cheeseburger at the Nook, where the atmosphere is warm and fun, and the room is filled with hundreds of decorated dollar bills hanging from the ceiling. There's an adjacent mini bowling alley for some old school fun, but be sure to reserve a lane well in advance because it's a popular hangout. Now, if you prefer to explore on foot like we do, then here's a great nine mile loop that will take you through a variety of cool neighborhoods. Start at the University of St. Thomas and travel east on historic Summit Avenue to enjoy the beautiful homes. Turn south on Fairview for just a block and then continue east on Grand until you reach McAllister College. Fuel up at the French Meadow Cafe near the college, but bring your wallet because it's not cheap. Then head down Snelling to St. Paul Academy in St. Catharines. I love the view of the park from the chapel. From there, turn south on Cleveland Avenue through Highland Park to the Ford Parkway and cross the bridge heading west. Then turn north on 42nd through comfortable and interesting neighborhoods until you reach Lake Street. And then head back east to where you started at St. Thomas. People are a little tougher and more independent when you get north of Minneapolis, and it's reflected in the landscape. The textures and colors transform from a carpet of green to a bushy tundra of aspen and golden tamarack. After riding for much of the day along the St. Croix Scenic Byway, which had a nice shoulder but too much traffic, I picked up the 70 mile long Willard Munger State Trail in Hinckley and rode 10 more miles before stopping for the night in Sandstone. That left me with about 66 miles the next day to Duluth. North winds at this latitude cut like a knife, and the forecast was promising an all-day 20 mile an hour headwind that I knew would be almost impossible by the time I pulled up to Lake Superior. So the next day I opted for the most direct possible route on Minnesota 23, heading straight northeast to Duluth. It was a tough day, and even in ideal weather, I would strongly recommend staying on the trail. The shoulder for much of 23 is not well suited for bikes, although within about 10 miles of Superior, it becomes a designated bike route with smooth, wide shoulders. As you descend into the massive basin of Lake Superior, the scenery is postcard beautiful. As I crossed the Route 2 bridge with the wind now buffeting me from the right, I did not feel transformed. I felt resolute and a little concerned about being thrown over the side of the bridge. I knew exactly where I was headed. This was a place that I'd known all along. When I started this project, I thought that the best part of my life was coming to an end. Not only was I wrong about that, but the idea of me searching for my calling was predicated on a false assumption. The calling necessarily has to be discovered. Way back in Nuclearis, I remarked that calling is the process of the Holy Spirit handing us the gift of true meaning, which is God's will. And we sometimes have to search for his hand until we find it. 
the key word that I missed even then was until. It's a choice that we make, but it's inevitable because it's God's will. I increasingly see everything, literally everything, as information that is from God's mind. We are that information, and everything we perceive is that information. Of course, the Bible has been telling us this all along. I think that this is why someone who's born again will grow fruit. God hands meaning and calling to his children. He gives it to us like the air we breathe, and then we move along the trajectory that is salvation. My calling is already here. <laughs>